Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Renee Mera. Thank you so much for joining Zoom in with Renee. Today, I'm talking to award-winning documentary filmmakers, Lena Jeswal and Katie Borum. Both Katie and Lena are professors at the Department of Communication in American University in Washington, D.C. Katie Borum is also the Executive Director, Center for Media and Social Impact, and both have co-directed this documentary called Mixed, which explores the issue of how it is to be a biracial child in America. So they went all across the country searching for answers. Let's hear it from both of you. Share that journey that because you both are also mothers of biracial children. So it really gives a different perspective and a unique lens to this issue. Um, so really what it was, I had been exploring these issues in my photography about um, race and identity. Those have been sort of centered uh, themes uh, around the work that I do. And then once my son was born, it really became um, even more interesting to me because we don't share the same race and nobody in my house shares the same race. So that to me was a pretty interesting thing to think about. And um, and I was getting hit with stereotypes of being the nanny in Washington, D.C. and, you know, that my son wasn't my son. Um, and so I had done a short little installation piece called I'm Not the Nanny. And um, Katie heard about it and um, showed me pictures of her children. And we were we and I said, oh, wow. OK, they do not look like you. Very inappropriately wrong now to say, but um and then we just started talking and and um, Katie's got a storied history and documentary and had wanted to make a longer piece. So Lena and I have been colleagues in the School of Communication, but we didn't really know each other very much. So truly what actually brought us together first, even as friends, was this commonality that we shared. So I, I obviously, well, I, I don't know if it's obvious. I am obviously a, a European uh, white woman and a European American and um, uh, Irish, Scottish, French, doesn't matter, regular uh, sort of European uh, uh, mixed person. Um, and my children are uh, half Trinidadian and of course half me. And so they really present not as white, which for me was a really, really transformative experience because um, it's, you know, as we know in this country, it's a completely different experience to go through any daily life uh, as a white presenting person uh, versus any kind of brown person in the United States. And so parenting my children became, you know, first of all, all of us uh, as new parents are trying to figure out how to do that at all. And then um, the racial differences were interesting because of, as Lena said, we both got different kinds of comments directed to us as mothers. So um, it's worth noting that no one ever asked me if I was the nanny. Uh, people did ask me in front of my kids a lot um, where they were from, uh, like really where they were from, which is such a dehumanizing question, especially when you ask it right in front of the child who's like, well, that's my mom. So I don't know what you mean. Right. Um, and I was asked sort of bizarre kind of comedic questions, I think, about whether I was my favorite one. Lena knows this was someone asked me if I was the fun babysitter. I don't know what that means. I guess I looked fun. So I guess that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I feel like, you know, the questions start up about where are your children from and what are they? And then um, the kind of trope type questions about, you know, will your children be confused by their identity, by their biracial identity? It sort of led Lena and I into this journey where we had the same questions, although we were coming at this as, as a different, a, a very different perspective. But we both had the same questions that we wanted to answer, which was, what really is our children's experience? It's not our experience. Uh, we don't know, Lena and I don't know what it's like to be biracial, but that will be our kids' experience. So I, I feel like really our journey set out very genuinely to ask and answer the questions of how does biracial identity develop differently? What kinds of 
ideas do we need to keep in mind when parenting biracial children to make sure that they feel um, equally parts of all of their different heritages and um, really as full uh, as full people. Can I ask you a question? What? Describe mommy. What color is mommy? Uh, light brown. Light brown? Okay, what color is daddy? Skin color. If somebody said to you, are you black? Are you white? What would you say? I like that answer. You constantly have people not understanding where to put you, not understanding like when you don't fit into any of the buckets that they already know to exist for a certain ethnic group. So it's like either box didn't work. I identify myself as South Asian or Indian American. That's how I would identify myself. My family is from the Deep South. Lena and I are both in mixed marriages. Although Lena and I might be very conscious, of race, we obviously don't know what it's like to be a mixed race person. Mm -hmm. So following mixed race stories across America. What are our kids experiencing? Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. What's gonna happen to them as they're discovering their identities? Hello. Why is a group about biracial identity so valuable for you? People say, oh, I forget you're black. Or I only look at you as Asian. Action. Mommy, you don't say white people, you say the people of not color. Nobody knew how to do my daughter's hair. Have you tried coconut oil? No. In like a handful? No. 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 <laughs> no. no. I think most white families put the peanut butter in, in the fridge. fridge. And I black people leave it out. You don't, we don't put peanut butter in the fridge. When I was growing up, I thought race was a bad word. I think it is absolutely necessary to talk about it and not to just like pretend, mm -hmm. you know, that like people don't notice race and people don't notice like multiracial identities. New developments tonight in the death of Tamir Rice, who was shot and killed by a Cleveland police officer. This weighs heavy on me because Elias will start walking to school with his buddies. I looked to my husband and I said to him that I was really glad that my son looked more like him than he did like me because I wanted to use every ounce of his white privilege to protect him. So my husband said the other day, I am fearful of the first time someone calls one of our kids a racial slur. For me as a parent, that's the moment that I dread. Like yeah. that is the moment that I know is coming. And Katie and I have to have this conversation with him. It is now here. I know there's a, there's a lot of people that are but still there's a lot of misunderstanding, put them in different buckets and that, and if you can't put them in the way we want to, and they don't fit in, we don't know, you know, giving those glares, so the cold glances, and you know, is that a nanny, or is that a babysitter, or are they adopted? So it's, just, it's very tough for the child. I mean, one hand, yes, the parenting becomes an issue. You have never gotten used to this kind of uh, idea while you were growing up. You have a biracial, you know, you've got biracial children, and then you're like, so what do I tell my children? How do I, how do they perceive this? And how do they become confident in themselves? So there's a lot of issues where even parents have to revisit how they're going to be uh, teaching their kids uh, in a society that sometimes may not be accepting of the fact that they are of different colors. I know a lot of friends who are biracial, uh, either they go with one race because they feel more comfortable with the color of their skin. But do you feel that the color of the skin is, should not be the only way to define a person? And if we are doing it, then we are putting them in different categories and slots and they don't belong in those little buckets. Well, I think that there's um, multiple things uh, going on. So also, I just want to stress that, you know, our kids are developmentally are, are very um, together, right? <laughs> so and there and part of that is because, you know, um, Katie and I follow we what we've looked at the research that the um, that the leading scholars have been doing in terms of biracial identity. And um, and some of that just comes natural as a parent. And we are also very privileged to live in. I live in the fourth most diverse city in America. So um, it, socioeconomically, you know, um, race, gender, et cetera. So we uh, our children don't have 
necessarily those kinds of experiences because everybody around them sort of looks like them or has another, you know, diverse element to them. So, so um, they don't get, they don't get called out on that. Um, but we, we like to recognize and tell them, you know, and remind them of um, both of their races, both, both, well, in my case, both the race, both sides of their race that they are, that you're white and Indian. And we don't, you know, they'll fluctuate through moments of where they'll maybe feel more attached to one race or the other. And that also depends on the gender of the parent, at least for in my situation, can't speak for everybody. But, you know, when my um, son Mm -hmm. is feeling really sort of more attached to his dad, then he may be leaning more towards, you know, uh, identifying as that race. But really, it has to do with the gender more than it does with the race. Um, and then when he's around my my parents and my family, then if, then he leans more towards being the Indian side. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that we've learned through the research is that um, as long as we as parents don't make them choose, don't make them pick, understand that identity is fluid. And it's I mean, just like my identity in high school is certainly not, I hope, not the same as it is now as a 50 year old woman. So, and a mother and, you know, a a professor and all of these things. And also how our identities fluctuate from job to job, you know, from situation to situation. I am not the same person in my home that I am at work. Mm -hmm. And so what our kids hopefully see and get confidence from is knowing that they at home, they can be either of any of those identities. And that's really what's good for them in their, um, in their racial forming, their identity forming. Yeah, so it's like straddling between cultures and races and kids learn to adapt very easily. How Mm -hmm. was it uh, when you share those experiences of biracial children in the documentary? Was it tough to uh, get the information out many times? You know, people may say off camera a lot of stuff and when they go on camera, they freeze. They don't want to talk about the real feelings because they feel they may get hurt inside or somebody might not understand them. Did you encounter that kind of uh, experience? No, not really. Katie, do you want to talk about the swirls? Because they, that yeah, swirl, yeah. yeah th- thank you for that question. I would say, yeah, I mean, t- I agree with Lena. I think that people of mixed race identity were really happy to talk about this because what we heard actually over and over again Uh, was that they felt like their unique story maybe had not been told. So it's only been since the census of 2020 in this country that we have even allowed people to check more than one box in terms of their racial and ethnic identity. So that's actually worth noting. So if you think about it that way, you know, 23 years ago, we weren't even allowing from a structural standpoint people to even say they were more than one thing. So Lena's boy and my children would have both had to pick, you know, just one thing. And and that would have been what we know from the research, actually challenging for them emotionally because they know that they have one parent that's one thing and another. Um, So by and large, biracial young people in particular felt very happy to be asked about their unique experiences there was a lot of humor in it. Um, mm-hmm. Lena mentions the a group called the Swirls yes. or the Duke Swirl. They were at Duke University, a student organization that really was formed for biracial and multiracial young people to come together and really have fun together, talk about their unique experiences, talk about their shared experiences, and really find a place where they could kind of be together in that identity. And that group, as you'll see in the film, is very funny. They have lots of jokes about, you know, uh, the walking in to a restaurant with the white parent and the brown presenting girl, like the, you know, the hostess doesn't know if they're related, (laughs) you know. So they all shared kind of funny stories. But I think the bottom line is, uh, you know, like most of us, we want to be seen in our unique identities. And the story, it's not that Lena and I told the only story that can ever be told about mixed race people. We certainly did not. Um, but to tell even one piece of it felt um, we received a lot of joy about that. 
And just to emphasize something that Lena said that we think is probably one of the most important takeaways of the film, like our genuine learning is that when we force multiracial young people who are developing their identities, when we force them to say you're either Indian or white or black or whatever one of your halves is or one of your thirds is, we actually cause them a little bit of emotional distress. It's actually psychologically confidence boosting when we can remind and validate their full selves. And so that really is an important parenting takeaway for us and something that we really genuinely learned. Because I think there are probably a lot of well-meaning attempts to kind of say, well, you present as X and so you are X. And actually the the person knows that they're more than one thing, right? So I, if that's an important thing for those of us who are monoracial, <laughs> um, to, which is a term that we also learned, uh, to really understand and take to heart. Kids, biracial kids are also exposed to different cultures at a very young age and at the, exp the horizons expand. So they are think more tolerant about in societies. I think that is something that I feel is so very essential these days. I mean, we do come in a, a diverse communities now, especially when you're in New York or DC. These are country, I mean, these are cities that are very urban and people understand, but then you have these biracial children who understand culture so well. I mean, they can fit in an Indian culture, mm -hmm. Italian culture or white culture or any culture because, hey, you know, my parents are mixed, so I can understand that. So I think that is a one big solid point that they have on their side. <laughs> but we do. We, yes. And um, but we do want to be careful that we don't because we also hear like from well-meaning people um, and they uh, luckily have not said it to our kids, but they said, said it to us as parents of like, well, this is how we solve race in America. Right. I mean, the more and more the multicultural um, uh, multiracial the population becomes, then we don't have to worry about racism. And we know that that clearly is not true. And we don't want to put that burden on um, on just the multiracial um, people to be able to figure out how to deal with race in America for sure. But, um, but yes, and, and that, and part of that, um, what you were speaking about, um, comes across in the research that we've read is that as long as you do, as Katie said, as long as you do, um, remind them and celebrate all parts of their facets, then they know, you know, when to, they know it's, it's a little bit like code switching and they know when to be in what culture and one area and the other, and um, myself growing up in America, I actually really related to so much of the research because I think being bicultural is is similar, not the same, but similar enough to being multiracial. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, bicultural, and then you're talking about biracial. There's somewhere there's they're, they're converged, but they are have their own identities. Moving on to creating healthy identities for biracial children, for their social development, for their well-being. How do you address that issue? Well, one thing that I think we'll start with is that I feel like Lena and I are always careful to say this when we talk about the film, that we ourselves are not subject matter experts on this. We, Our job in the film is to take viewers on a journey into meeting lots of different people, hearing different perspectives, and hearing from people who really are subject matter experts. And so one of the main people in the film is an amazing scholar at Duke University named Dr. Sarah Gaither, who herself is biracial. So she has called her work uh, me search. <laughs> um, but she, you know, she's really motivated to understand the psychology. She is a um, social psychologist, so she is truly a subject matter expert on the psychological development of young people with um, different racial identities. Um, so we really look to her cues a lot. Hopefully someday she will write a book because we gained a lot of learning from reading her peer-reviewed research as, as scholars ourselves, Lena and I like to read things like that. Um, but, you know, I guess broad strokes is um, back to what we've already covered a little bit, which is this idea that forcing young people to choose uh, one particular identity may be well-meaning, um, but it can be psychologically damaging. So I, I think that that's something that Lena and I have really thought a lot about as parents. And 
um, certainly in my house, we have a lot of uh, fun jokes about the, you know, because I, I like to be funny with my kids. That's part of how we do our learning with each other. And so we have a lot of uh, fun jokes about, um, you know, who they are and how they represent and things like that. So I find that humor can sometimes be helpful, but we're not, we're not cognitive psychologists, unfortunately. Yeah. One thing that I would say, though, and this goes, it doesn't matter um, if you're monoracial or multiracial, um, speaking to your kids about race at an early age, no matter what race you are, um, is unbelievably important yes. in, in this in this country, because yes. here's the thing we um, neither Katie and I can tell you what it means to be multiracial. Um, but through the film, we do hear voices of of people who are there, but that's not just their only experience. You know, that's not just the experience of all uh, monoracial people. Um, so, or I mean, uh, of all multiracial people. And so being able to talk about race, having, having, you know, the white kids in my kids' school understand what it means to be multiracial, having them understand what it means to be black, or even having conversations of why um, you can't wear your hoodie up uh, you know, or certain social cues that, that, um, our children, we, we, uh, protect in certain ways because of X, Y, and Z. Like there's a scene in the film where Katie talks about how, um, with another family, how they're not, uh, the kids are not allowed to play with Nerf guns outside. Um, you know, and these are the real, the real things and why my friends can play with Nerf guns. Why can't I play with Nerf guns outside? And so there's, there's a little bit of a different way that we parent, when you have especially brown or black presenting boys. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I think if if everybody talked about race, it, it wouldn't be as a surprise to the the white kid in school of like, well, why can't your son go outside and play this game or do this? Oh, I get it. OK, let's do this instead, you know, because they've had this understanding or a little bit of a conversation um, about race in their home so that they understand a little bit more. Um, because then you also just don't leave it to the responsibility of the brown and black people to talk about race and be the only ones that are talking about race. So I think um, any family that this, it's probably the one of the key things that you can do and you can do it developmentally at any age. There's lots of books. Dr. Ibram Kendi has written a children's book. Um, so there's lots of ways to start to talk about race um, within the family uh, dynamic. So I would say that would be another thing that I think is highly important. Yes. And I think also um, biracial children looking for bone marrow donors because you are looking at two races and at times it can facilitate the process. Actually, it's a little bit more of a challenge because um, what we found in our research, yes. So we, um, it didn't, un unfortunately, um, it didn't make the film because we had been following a story of a bone marrow donation. And um, again, unfortunately, the, um, the, the person that we were following, she passed away before we were able to um, fully interview her. But we interviewed um, the director of Be The Match and so we were going to have this whole section in the film, and that's really part of the activism. Part of the film was going to be centered around blood, um, uh, uh, bone marrow and donations and things like that. And um, it's actually trickier because if if my son, who's half Indian and half white, but that white is all mixed, um, he might need that same exact half white and half Indian mix to match him. Yeah, right. That's and right. Um, as you and I have talked already about yes. the, um, yes. because you've done so much work with yes. um, yeah. the uh, bone marrow and um, bl uh, blood drives and things, yes. you already know the stigma around uh, specifically oh. South Asian communities that mm. um, to even get them to donate, right? Mm. To, to donate, um, to be on the registry. And so it actually becomes a little bit more of a challenge for mixed race uh, people uh, because they really have to have the right exact mix. Yeah, the match sometimes doesn't happen with, you know, to identify all the markers. Yes, it's, it could be a tough process. Um, so coming back to mixed, you're going to have a sequel. Your kids are growing up now from the time <laughs> you started. Uh, so you want to have a sequel now growing up? Biracial. <laughs> oh, my God. That's actually a good idea. We've never, maybe we should wait till they're in college, Lena. 
Yeah, you should. And so right now my 13 year old would be like, why are you following me? Yeah, around? exactly. Yeah. Now it's for you. So, so going you know, up, I like to bribe him going up biracial, grown up biracial. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that might not be, you know, there's a, there's a history of certain types of documentaries, like the growing up seven, growing up yeah. 14. There's a series yeah. um, that they follow every few years. And maybe this would be a fun thing yes. to do when they're, when they're older. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Be a fun idea to see how they how they've grown and what their perceptions are about life and how they see themselves and how they see everybody and how the world sees them. The time my son saw the film, he um he hugged me and he said, "Thank you, mommy, for making this for me." Mm -hmm. So that's the best uh, critical reception that we needed to hear. So mm -hmm. uh, so I do know that he um, and we were very protective of our kids, actually, how much we put of them in the film, because, you know, they were young and we want to still, um, you know, what's OK at five may not be the same as okay, what's OK at 13. You know? And I think in a couple of decades, the average American child is going to be very much biracial. So we're moving in that direction. So society does understand so you're offering this lens in the very beginning now maybe 20 years later, 30 years later, it'll be such a commonplace thing. So people won't even talk too much about it. It won't be like an issue. Uh, any other documentaries coming up after this? Anything new from both of you? Well, Katie just launched. I'm going to, I'm going to brag about her. And so she doesn't even know that I'm doing this, but um, oh. Katie's third book just came out. The revolution will be hilarious. So oh. it's in a funny way. Uh, thanks, Lena. Well, so I, I also write books about um, creative culture and how entertainment culture can be harnessed for social good to build a world that is more tolerant, a little bit nicer to each other. It's sort of a very reductive way to say it, but I think it really does come down to that. Um, so the book is on uh, is about uh, the research and making of comedy for social change around issues of mm -hmm. racial justice, climate justice. Uh, lots of different issues that can be considered taboo or complex or hard. And uh, there's a lot about how comedy is a source of resilience and catharsis and more likely to be shared. And there are all these sort of cultural effects of comedy that allows us to kind of engage with people and lived realities a little bit differently. So yeah, it just came out last week. So I'm, wow. yeah, I'm right in between two book events. So I am I guess I'll think about movies when I'm done with this book thing. I like the title, The Revolution to be hilarious. And I think comedy is such a serious uh, art. To be really uh, funny and make a social impact, you really have to understand how to reach out to the audience and have that chemistry and rapport to create that change in a fun and engaging way. Yes. So I always wanted to be a stand-up comedian, but uh, because it's so it's therapeutic, so, it's so therapeutic, you just get it out of your system. Everything that is complex and you make it in a fun way has a dominant effect and it can be very impactful. So Lena, what are you working on? <laughs> Use this interview to find this out. Oh, uh, well, I just finished a piece about the spotted lanternfly um, for a journal um, uh, on the lantern fly in general, both an artistic perspective and a, uh, a little bit more academic look at that. So those pieces mm -hmm. are done. And, um, you know, I have so much work that I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of looking through the archives to, uh, I mean, archives of meaning like the last four or five years of work mm -hmm. that I have. I last time I went to India, it was in 20, 18 December of 2018 Ooh. and um I shot a lot of images of um the pujas and things there and the uh, making of the statues and the idols and then dipping them into the Ganges and things like that so I haven't had a chance to even think about that body of work yet to make a little series um out of that but uh I'm trying to get back into my photographic roots because Perfect. Well, well thank you so very much Lena Jaswal and Katie Borum, co-directors of the documentary Mixed. It's all about biracial children, and I think we can learn so much from these mothers of biracial children because they give it from their own personalized, unique lens. I'm Dr. Renee Merrill. 
Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy, stay positive.